everybody and welcome. It's lovely to see you all here in the Jewish Museum. This afternoon, Yankee is going to talk to us about three different libel cases. I'll let him fill you in on them because he's much better than I am. And um, in a, a couple of weeks... Four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks today. He's going to talk about Marcus Whitston and the yeah. hat and ribbon people. Yeah. So that'll be interesting. So Yankee. Today... I want to look at three libel trials that were inspired by the Holocaust. The first, chronologically, was the Kastner libel case, which some of you may not have heard of, but I'm going to look at that at the end of my talk. It was the State of Israel versus Malchiel Greenwald, and it was heard in a Jerusalem court in 1954. The second, chronologically, was in 1964, when Polish Catholic Dr. Vladislav Derin sued the American Jewish writer Leon Uris in a London court for defaming him in the famous novel Exodus. And the third Leiden case, chronologically, 2001, was also in a London court when David Irving sued the American Jewish historian Deborah Lipstadt for claiming in her book Denying the Holocaust that Irving was a Holocaust denier. These are the three uh, libel cases I want to look at. Now I'm going to start with Leon Uris. I reckon that most people here in the room would know of and would have read um, Exodus. Um, not the world's greatest literary work, <laughs> um, but one of, the, one of the books that I think has probably had a, more, a bigger impact than, than, than most. Um, just personally, I would know of dozens of people whose lives were changed just by reading Exodus. And their lives were changed and they moved to Israel and, and it has been the, probably the main reason why in the 60s, late 50s, 60s and even 70s, um, thousands of Jews around the world, Britain and, and America and elsewhere, became Zionists, and I think this is, this is something that everyone knows. So, 1964, it's um, six years since Exodus was published, and it's 18 years since the Nazi war crimes tribunal were held in Nuremberg, and it's three years since the Eichmann trial. I just want to sort of put it in that sort of context. So it's, it's almost 20 years um, since the war. It's 19 years since the end of the war and the end of the Holocaust. So while conducting his research for Exodus, Uris came across horrific stories about medical experiments on otherwise healthy Jewish men, women, and children in Auschwitz. And in Exodus, the fictional Holocaust survivor, Don Dov Landau, is quoted as saying, here in block X, um, block 10, Dr. Wirths used women as guinea pigs, and Dr. Schumann sterilized by castration and x-ray, and Klauberg removed ovaries, and Dr. Dering performed 17,000 experiments in surgery without anesthetics. Dering was a Roman Catholic doctor who was sent to Auschwitz in 1940 for being active in the Polish underground. And in Auschwitz, he swiftly rose from laborer to prison doctor in charge of the operating theater in block 21. After leaving Auschwitz in mysterious circumstances, it was before the end of the war, Dering reached Britain with the help of fellow Poles in the British Army. In previous talks, I would have mentioned that the Polish army in exile in Britain was as anti-Semitic as the regular Polish army was in Poland. Just in parentheses. Three countries, Poland, France, and Czechoslovakia, all placed Daring on the United Nations war criminal list. So three countries knew of him, knew what he had done. And he spent 19 months in Brixton prison while Poland tried to persuade Britain to extradite him. Jewish circles in Britain saw the government's refusal to extradite Daring to Poland as confirmation that Britain was determined to end 
extraditions altogether. And again, that's something I spoke about um, last year in terms of the denazification process and how it petered out in Britain and other, other places. The extradition request for Derry was denied on grounds of mistaken identity. They brought a witness to London who did not successfully identify Derry. And it turns out that it was another doctor who had done him wrong. And because of that mis, um, uh, mistaken identity, Daring was, was let off. He one was released witness. with an apology. Me, one witness was brought. They didn't bring No, because this wasn't a trial. Okay. This was just to establish, could Daring be extradited to Poland? And the guy they brought he couldn't identify Daring because he was a different doctor. So, Daring is released with an apology, goes to work as a physician for the British Colonial Service in Somalia, where his work earns him an OBE, and he returns to London very early in the 1950s to work as a GP. Daring's wife and daughter spotted the offending passage only in 1962, which is like four years after the, uh, the book was um, published. Daring accuses Uris and the publisher and the printers of intolerable insult and he issued libel proceedings against all three. Worried about the insurance implications, the printers quickly capitulated, apologized, and paid Dering 500 pounds out of court. Uris and his publishers stood firm, and they spent two years gathering evidence from witnesses scattered all over the world. When Dering versus Uris and others finally came to court, in 1964, it aroused much publicity. The trial was held before a jury in Queen's Bench Court 7. This will become an important uh, fact later on. Presided over by Justice Horace Lawton. The trial was conducted in Greek, Polish, Hebrew, English, German, French and Ladino and lasted 18 days from the 1st of April, 1964. Appearing for Uris and the publisher, Gerald Gardiner, later Lord Chancellor of England, did not try to defend the accuracy of every line in Exodus. He claimed, however, that the passage, the Daring passage, was substantially true. 22 Auschwitz survivors testified at the trial that Daring had engaged in barbaric medical experiments on them. Each operation performed in Auschwitz, we're talking about uh, German authorities, of course, was meticulously recorded in a register <coughs> kept by Daring and his colleagues. And somehow, this register was smuggled out of Auschwitz and was produced in Many of the details were in Daring's hand handwriting and the tattooed numbers of the witnesses who came forward tallied with what it said in the register. Daring offered three justifications in his defense. One, he had no choice. He was a prisoner. Two, no one in his position could have refused the order to conduct these medical experiments. And three, given the circumstances, he had behaved in an exam ex <laughs> exemplary, <laughs> exemplary fashion. This was, this was his third line of defense. He produced evidence that if he had refused to take part in these operations, he would have been executed or subjected to heavy punishment. A not unreasonable justification, however, his claim was demolished by the testimony of a French woman, not Jewish, called Dr. Adeleine Otval. And she told the court that she had refused to take part in these operations in Auschwitz. Lord Gardner asked her, as a result, were you shot? <laughs> <laughs> no, she answered. And more than one observer in court formed the impression that Daring 
never got it. He never fully comprehended the enormity of his actions. Didn't actually understand why he was on trial. He was so convinced that that his his reasonings were correct that he, he, he seemed a bit almost removed. He seemed almost indifferent to the suffering he had inflicted on patients, insisting all the time that his behavior had been benevolent. Uris and his publisher admitted, and I mentioned this earlier with Lord Gardner, they could not stand behind the assertion in Exodus that he had performed 17,000 operations. But they did produce a list of 130 individuals on whom shocking operations were performed. The defendants were also not able to prove that Dering always operated without anesthetic, but they presented evidence that operations were conducted under painful spinal uh, uh, anesthetic that left the patient conscious. The jury returned on the 6th of May 1964 and announced that they had found in favour of the plaintiff, of Dr. Dering. In other words, they accepted that Uris's allegations amounted to libel. But before Daring could savour his victory, the jury was asked to assess the harm done to his reputation. And they awarded him the smallest coin in the realm, a halfpenny. This was the first time this had ever happened in Britain, that someone was found, yes, you have been libeled, and he was awarded a halfpenny, and all costs, of course, found against him. He did not get his costs. For Daring, it was, obviously, it was an emphatic defeat. He died a year after the trial, leaving his defense team with a huge unpaid legal bill. 2,300 years ago, when um, Pyrrhus, the king of uh, Epirus, defeated the Romans in the Battle of Asculum, I hope that's the right way of pronouncing it, his army suffered irreplaceable, irreplaceable casualties. The king was overheard to say, one more such victory and I am undone. <laughs> the Daring case was a classic example of a Pyrrhic victory. In 1970, Uris wrote another of his cracking bestsellers. It was the courtroom novel which he called Q. B7, Queen's Bent Court 7, a very thinly fictionalized version of the Daring Libel trial, and in, it was adapted into a mini-series on TV in 1974, starring, among others, Anthony Hopkins, John Gilgood, and Edith Evans. So he was never one to miss a trick, mm -hmm. uh, Leon Uris. The second Holocaust-related libel trial in London followed the publication of American author Deborah Lipstadt's 1995 four, sorry, denying the Holocaust the growing assault on truth and memory. It's kind of like a book that should have been published yesterday, isn't it? <coughs> published by Penguin, and here is a passage from that book. Irving is one of the most dangerous spokespersons for Holocaust denial, familiar with historical evidence, he bends it, until it conforms with his ideological leanings and political agenda, a man who is convinced that Britain's great decline was accelerated by its decision to go to war with Germany, he is the most facile at taking accurate information and shaping it to conform to his conclusions. This is what she wrote in her 1994 book. The Irving referred to by Mr. Uh, Ms. Lip Lipstadt was, of course, British author David Irving, and I see that Kevin is holding a copy of one of his books, known for his tireless efforts to narrow the moral distance between the Allies and the Nazis. In 1963, he wildly overstated the number of civilians killed in the 1945 Dresden bombing raid, relying on a document that he knew was a forgery. Regarding the Holocaust, Irving persistently claimed that the number of Jews killed by the Nazis was far lower than commonly asserted. He claimed that the gas chambers, there weren't any, that the killing of the Jews was not systematic, that the Holocaust was an invention of the Allies, and it was then exploited by the Jews to swindle the Germans and to create the State of Israel. 
But dare I say, without being lynched, that his position was not very far from the way then President Obama described the creation of Israel in his notorious um, 2000 and when, when was he first elected? 2010. Years ago. So in, in 2011 um, lecture in Cairo um, where he basically said the same about Israel being solely the result of, uh, um, of the Holocaust and European guilt. Following the publication of Lipstadt's book, Irving filed a lawsuit in 1996 against Lipstadt and Penguin, claiming that the book represented him to be a Nazi apologist, a racist, an anti-Semite, and a consorter with racists and anti-Semites. Irving's decision to sue in London was a smart move, as was Daring's decision um, to sue uh, Juris in London, since under English libel law, the claimant only has to show that the statements are defamatory. So it's the defendants who are the one. Sorry, the claimant only has to show it's defamatory. They don't have to prove anything else. <coughs> Lip, Lipstadt didn't need to. You know, she could have just uh, either settled or, or whatever. And in any case, she was in she was in America, so she didn't have to come to Britain. But she felt compelled to defend herself, fearing that if Irving was successful, it would confer legitimacy on Holocaust denial. And because Lipstadt's offending passages in the book were clearly defamatory, Lipstadt could not claim that she had been misrepresented, nor did she try to do so. In other words, Lipstadt and the publisher had to prove that Irving was a Holocaust denier, a falsifier, a bigot who manipulated and distorted real documents, and who deliberately misrepresented evidence that conformed to his ideological viewpoints. Penguin hired their own libel experts, while Lipstadt hired British Jewish lawyer Anthony Julius, who was famous for having handled the divorce of Diana. Princess Diana. Mm. Julius retained the professor of modern history at Cambridge University, Richard Evans. Um, anyone who's read mm. Holocaust material would know that he is one of the foremost, he is absolutely one of the foremost um, Holocaust um, experts. And he spent two years examining all of Irving's work. He read the lot, everything the man had ever written. Now, while the defense did not have to prove that the Holocaust happened, they did have to show that any reasonable and fair-minded historian would not doubt it, and that Irving must therefore not be reasonable or fair-minded. This, this was the, the legal um, shenanigans that, that this, was, this is what led their defense. They had to prove that Irving did indeed falsify the historical record. And they also had to prove Irving's associations with extremist neo-Nazi groups. I reckon that that was the easiest to prove because there was so much documentary evidence. Evans and his research assistants finished their 740-page report in the summer of 1999. And Evans concluded, not one of Irving's books, speeches, or articles, not one paragraph, not one sentence in any of them can be taken on trust as an accurate representation of its historical subject. All of them are completely worthless as history because Irving cannot be trusted anywhere in any of them to give a reliable account of what he is talking or writing about. If we mean by historian someone who is concerned to discover the truth about the past and to give as accurate a representation of it as possible, then Irving is not a historian. And during cross-examination, Irving could offer no effective answer to the expert witnesses. Um, I forgot to mention that <coughs> there was only a single judge for this case. Unlike the Uris case, which was a jury, somehow Julius played on Irving's ego 
and said in front of the, uh, the judge, um, I think that the judge is objective enough to look at the evidence on both sides and to make a decision that we can all abide by. It was a gamble and it paid off because Irving felt very complimented that he was sort of being regarded as somebody who could be objective. I don't know what would have happened with the jury, but by leaving it to a single judge, this definitely affected the, uh, the outcome. And Irving, in his closing statement, fell back on familiar anti-Semitic tropes, claiming to have been a victim of an international Jewish conspiracy for more than three decades. Well, join the, join the queue. In his judgment, presented in April 2000, the judge said that Evans had justified each and every one of his criticisms. And the judge continued, it is my conclusion that no objective, fair-minded historian would have serious cause to doubt that there were gas chambers at Auschwitz and that they were operated on a substantial scale to kill hundreds of thousands of Jews. My conclusion is that Irving's denials of these propositions were contrary to the evidence, and the allegation that Irving is a racist is also established. The court ruled against Irving's claim of libel relating to Holocaust denial, since Lipstadt had proved her claim that he had deliberately distorted evidence. After the trial, an unrepentant Irving was asked, will you stop denying the Holocaust on the basis of this judgment, and unsurprisingly, he replied, good Lord, no. <laughs> so he totally unmoved by the, by the trial. Uh, one of his supporters said the judge's verdict was predictable given the display of naked Jewish power during the trial. Julius's relationship with Penguin and its defense team had not been harmonious. Penguin fought the case solely on the principle of free speech and did not involve itself at all in the Holocaust denial argument. And to Julius's dismay after the trial, Penguin brought out a paperback on the trial and dedicated the proceeds to some UK charity. Julius said if Penguin had acted with common decency, they would have dedicated the proceeds to a Holocaust charity. An interesting side. Thank you.